Welcome, everyone. I am Jeff Lewis. And I'm Tim Kowal. Both Jeff and I are certified appellate specialists, but we're uncertified podcast hosts. In this podcast, we bring our audience of trial and appellate attorneys some news and perspective they can use in their practice. And a quick thank you to our sponsor. Our podcast is sponsored by Case Text. Case Text is a legal research tool that harnesses AI and a lightning fast interface to help lawyers find case authority fast. I've been a Case Text subscriber since 2019, and I highly endorse their service. Listener of the podcast will receive a 25% lifetime discount available to them if they sign up at casetext.com slash calp. That's casetext.com slash C-A-L-P. All right, Jeff. And uh, today, as you know, we are pleased to welcome Kyle Schneeberg to the show, joining us in our uh, live audience, uh, our live studio, uh, which is <laughs> which is strange because we don't have a studio. It's actually just sitting in Jeff's lap now. Uh, Kyle is a founding partner of Bedsore Law, a national law firm fighting for uh, nursing home justice. Prior to his current position, Kyle spent 16 years as a trial attorney representing injured plaintiffs. He is an alumnus of the Jerry Spence Trial Lawyers College, and he has spoken on expert panels about skilled nursing facility liability to the USC Leonard Davis School of Gerontology, the California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform, and the Consumer Attorneys Association of Los Angeles. Throughout his career, Kyle has tried numerous cases to jury verdict and helped injured victims recover over $100 million. Uh, Kyle, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Tim. It's a pleasure to be here with both of you. Well, and Kyle, uh, uh, was there any important details that I left out of uh, those introductory remarks? I think you covered it. You know, one thing I mentioned sometimes is that I started out with a defense background, and I've been from solo practitioner firms to large firms, mid-sized mid -size firms. So I, I've got a wide range of experience seeing this industry from all kinds of different angles. Yeah, and I was uh, I was curious to know a little bit more about uh, the Jerry Spence uh, Trial Lawyers College. Uh, I've always heard about that and thought that must be a just a, a completely me memorable and game-changing experience. Uh, can you share a little bit about it? I'd love to. It it was. Um, I'm fortunate to have gone in 2018. It changed a bit after 2020. It's now called the Spence Trial Method, and it's a bit different. A lot of the same people, but different. You know, that, that was an experience like no other. They took about 50 attorneys twice a year, uh, hundreds of applications. So it was somewhat exclusive. And we went out to an old cattle ranch that Jerry Spence owned about two hours outside of Jackson, Wyoming. Um, we had virtually no cell phone coverage, no internet. And we went out there for about three weeks and we worked on legal theory for about 12 hour, 12 hours a day about seven days a week it was it was very intense and they put you out in the middle of nowhere so you don't have any uh any distractions correct by design yeah yeah so what was that uh that total immersive experience did that that did that change the experience do you think oh a hundred percent uh not just professionally but but as a person um mm. we went very deep uh Jerry Spence designed this to sort of impart how he approached cases and tried cases. And he was a very big believer in uh, something that sounds a little crazy called psychodrama. Um, even the psychodramatists admit it's like the worst name you could give, mm. you know, any practice. But what it refers to is, is essentially psychology through dramatization of people's traumas. And in order to learn how to do this, we we did it on ourselves. And it, as you can imagine, it was very intense. Yeah. Yeah. So is it more uh, uh, psychology and persuasion driven than the nuts and bolts trial practice? You know, how to get uh, get get a, a document in under, under the business records exception, say, I think that's probably <laughs> not the focus of the of the Spence method. Fair. And, and it was taught by volunteer trial attorneys from all over the country who had been involved with the program for a long time. Um, but what we really studied were two things, empathy, because it's, it's very hard to represent somebody who has had a serious injury if we can't empathize uh, with what they've gone through, what they're going through, but also storytelling. In other words, how do we communicate that experience to a judge or a defense counsel or a jury? Yeah. 
Well, sorry to get way late on that. I just uh, so interested in hearing uh, about the Spence uh, Trial College. Uh, Kyle, tell us a little bit more about your trial career, and I, I'm particularly int interested in how you how you counted up to a hundred million dollars. That's that's an amazing. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to uh, need to see the spreadsheet point. on that. Yeah, it yeah. would take a while to recreate. You know, I, as I mentioned, I've I've worked for many offices in my almost 20 year career. Um, I've had the good fortune to work with some of the greatest trial attorneys in the nation and been part of trial teams where we've gotten uh, eight and nine figure verdicts, um, huge settlements. So, you know, what, in fact, one of the, the greatest attorneys in LA, uh, Rex Paris, who's an old trial lawyers college guy, I think put it best to get a gigantic settlement or verdict, you've got to turn down a big settlement or verdict. And huh. to get those, you typically need a very serious, legitimate case. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Jeff, I don't know if you know, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I've known uh, Kyle for, uh, for a year or two. And then recently we were on opposite sides in a case. And so, oh. so at first I liked Kyle and then I hated Kyle. But now that case is done, so I like Kyle again. <laughs> okay, bad time. I, I appreciate the uh, appreciate the zealous advocacy there, Tim. <laughs> yeah. Well, as long as uh, I I didn't want uh, I didn't want my case to make a you know make a Richter scale uh, you know event on your one hundred million dollar recovery. I, I don't think uh, I don't think it's going to to uh, to add up to to much in there. Um, I don't think you're going to have to update that number, Kyle, after our case. But um, yeah, it was uh, it was. Uh, uh, n nice to work with a with a good attorney who's also ethical. Someone that you don't have to, you know, you, you you don't exchange fire breathing um, uh, comments with. <laughs> I feel the same way. All right, so Kyle, before we talk about bed sore law, your current practice, let's talk a little broader about the state of personal injury law in California. Uh, do we have too many personal injury lawsuits in California? So you know. It's good that you asked this question because this comes up in every trial. And, and if if we are not, uh, if, if plaintiffs' attorneys are not raising this in voir dire, um, it, it'll probably come up organically. Uh, I bring it up because we want to find out how people are going to react to our cases. It, the reality is this is how we settle disputes in, in our modern society. And... Uh, it's really the most just way to do it. You know, the alternatives are what fist fights or, you know, <laughs> Hatfields and McCoys. So we, we definitely don't want to, uh, I, I think, I think it's just a, um, part of human nature that we have these disputes that we got to resolve one way or another. Mm -hmm. Well, let me say this though. I'm, I'm a business owner. Uh, I'm an employer. Aren't, uh, personal injury lawsuits bad for business? You know, I'm a business owner too. Um, personal injury laws don't discriminate against business. And, you know, what we have is a negligence system that's based in common law that's been around for hundreds of years. And if anything, the only laws we have relative to personal injury laws are laws that actually minimize, uh, that common law tradition. The reality is this is how we get justice. And I think in any society, you know, justice is a good thing. The, the more injustice we have, the 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 worst it's going to be for everybody, including businesses and their owners. Oh, how much does uh, how much does the uh, uh, the the increase of the you know the the prevalence of insurance play into the number of uh, a personal injury cases and the size of the settlements, the nature of the negotiations? I imagine a lot of uh, personal in injury plaintiffs, um, you know, maybe let's uh, say a hundred years ago. Uh, they may have gotten hurt, but figured, well, you know, it's, it's not that big a deal. This this person doesn't have the money, but now everyone thinks, well, you know, so and so is insured, so they're not going to care. They'll just uh, let the insurance company pay for it. I wonder if that has has that changed the dynamics of a uh, personal injury, um, uh, personal injury litigation. Well, insurance companies are very relevant to the the whole system. You know, every now and then I come across these old uh, case. Uh, opinions from the 30s and 40s and 50s sometimes we see them even in the 1880s and insurance has been around for a long time i uh, i would say in my experience 99 percent of these recoveries verdict settlements are against the insurance company and the insurance company is responsible for those so the personal exposure or the or the uh actual exposure to a business it's it's pretty rare in my experience mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it's it's the uh 
the, the the insurance company becomes the defendant. They're becoming the uh, they're the pocket that they're that the plaintiff's trying to reach into. Well, there's an important distinction there because they don't become the defendant, which I I think is somewhat disingenuous in our society. Because if they have a 90 year old lady who you know ran over three people, the insurance company gets to come in and say, well. Miss so and so, you know, is ninety and doesn't have any money and this and that. But meanwhile, there may be a two million dollar insurance policy behind the uh, the curtain that that we can't tell the jury about. Right. Huh. Interesting. Well, uh, and does California impose any limits on recovery for non economic injuries in California? They do. Um, there are several laws that govern. Uh, the recovery of damages, et cetera. The, but the, the main one that comes up in my practice is, of course, MICRA, the Medical Injury Compensation Reform Act from 1975 that capped non-economic damages at $250,000. Oh. Yeah, what, have, uh, what, what are your opinions about uh, the MICRA law? I, I know there's a lot of pros and cons about um, you know how that, that really limits um, legitimate plaintiff's recovery uh, because litigation is expensive, and when you go into these cases, you need to find an attorney who will represent. You know, often you're looking for a contingency attorney, and if the uh, if the damages are are capped to such an extent that contingency doesn't make sense, then you're uh, you're kind of pricing a lot of uh, a lot of plaintiffs out of the market, aren't? Uh, so what so what are the kind of give us a a city bus tour on the pros and cons of the micro law? Right, it. Um... It's one of the worst, most unjust laws for consumers in history. I mean, it absolutely has blown out responsibility for many kinds of injuries. It Micra did not cap economic damages. So, you know, um, the example I've always gone to is if a doctor uh, did surgery on Jeff here and, uh, you know, injured him uh, negligently so that he lost his right arm and now his livelihood is affected, his life is affected, there's a certain amount of economic damage that, that can be attributed to that. That case is probably viable. If he had um, just severely wounded Jeff and he's able to still do his job, but he has excruciating pain in his arm for the rest of his life, that's a 250 case. And the risk of that case may not you know, it it may prevent Jeff from finding someone to represent him. Yeah. Sure. Now, now, Kyle, most of your practice has been uh, has been in uh, uh, is it medical uh, injury, nursing home injury? That's what you're doing now. Um, but what? what uh, but where where did you cut your teeth? What what kinds of injury cases? Well, I, I first cut my teeth on bad faith cases for farmers back oh. uh, almost 20 years ago. Um, so I've been around the block in a lot of different areas. I've done most of my work in general injury, but I have a, a history since approximately 2010 of handling elder abuse cases. I am not a typical uh, or, or, or uh, I'm not a medical negligence med mal attorney. I largely don't handle those. We do have a, an overlap, though, in elder abuse and medical negligence because of the nature yeah. of the laws. Yeah, yeah. Kyle, what are some uh, some lessons that you've learned about how to uh, how to have a successful personal injury practice? You know, there are a lot of lessons. Um, boy, I've le I've learned a lot of lessons in my career, <laughs> for better and worse. Uh, you know, authenticity goes a long way in this industry, in my opinion, um, with ourselves, with our clients. My my goal has really been to figure out what justice looks like for my clients. And I, and I think, you know, humbly, I've been fairly uh, successful doing that. I've had very few dissatisfied clients. I mean, there are some folks out there who I'm not sure if anyone can satisfy them. In fact, some of my best results have been uh, for clients who were not happy with them, even though they were phenomenal results. Yeah. But um being authentic with ourselves and with our clients is something I, I've learned is more important as I grow. Yeah. I'm reminded you told me once that uh, uh, just to kind of take a brief detour onto legal marketing, you were telling me about how you were doing some marketing at one time 
on Instagram, I think, or maybe, maybe TikTok's the, the big thing now. And people have been telling me the algorithms are on, on TikTok are driving uh, the search results on Google. And so I should I should be on TikTok. And I said, I can't imagine uh, what kind of appellate legal marketing I would do on TikTok. But, you know, the algorithms are the algorithms. Uh, it, uh, it, it, do you have any, uh, any comments on how to be authentic in your legal marketing in the social media age? Uh, I do. I, you know, any, any, so, and, and this comes from my TLC training, Trial Lawyers College. Jerry Spence is famous for saying, um, and, and by the way, he was, he was there. He uh, was there for one of the three weeks. Um, he was about 90 at the time. He is famous for saying, anybody can beat me in the courtroom if they can be more authentic than me. And, and authenticity is really where he comes from. I, I think this is how, um, maybe people get into trouble on social media is not being authentic. It's really a betrayal of people's expectations. And right now, uh, social media has caused every everyone to get personally involved. I mean, people think they know the person on social media, right? So if that authenticity falls apart, the, these people who have bought into that feel terribly betrayed and, it, and you know, it becomes very emotional. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I yeah, I, I think that's I think that's very interesting. What what do you mean by that? Not that not being authentic is a betrayal of people's expectations. Is that are you talking about when a, a client hires you after they have gotten comfortable with you and they get a sense about who you are, but then if you go into the courtroom and you become a different person, uh, is that what you're talking about? It's a betrayal of the client's expectations? Um not else? so much that. You know, I I've had maybe well i've had the experience of taking on cases from uh other law firms um one of the firms i worked for did a lot of work for attorneys who didn't litigate in other words the, the, the case originated with other attorneys and then they would send it to us if it needed to go toward trial in litigation and what was very common is i would find out the clients did not have full information a, about a lot of their cases, the risks, mm. the benefits. Um, and as you can imagine, that uh, was very troubling to them. Yeah. Um, Interesting. All right. Well, let's, uh, I, I had one other question about uh, you know, you, your experience or your perspective on personal injury practice. Uh, now, there are a lot of personal injury attorneys out there, as you know. And uh, in fact, you can see a lot of them on your, your way to and from work from the freeway on the on the billboards uh do all personal uh, injury attorneys practice basically the same way what are the what are the different schools of thought among personal injury attorneys no and that's what makes this industry so unique um every attorney i i believe and from my own experience approaches a case differently uh there are attorneys who again are interested in the pre-litigation process um they're not interested in the litigation process and then there are attorneys uh, large look like myself who have been involved mostly in the litigation process um we can even get into the nuances of the different areas of injury law so every every attorney i think has a different um model for how they try to win a case for for their clients what are some of those different models some is just what just uh, just trying to get a settlement or going for the big bucks uh by going to trial um what's what's the best approach what's the kyle schneeberg approach you know, my, my approach is to find out what uh, my clients want to do. And and I, tr I work really hard to spend time with my clients to educate them. And it's been my experience that the more I educate them, the more time I spend with them, with, you know, within reason, because our time is, of course, limited. Um, I get a more happy, satisfied client at the end of the process if they know, you know, what the risks and benefits are. What One of my major criticisms in the personal injury space. It has to do with the law change back in 2012 that said if an insurance company paid a certain amount for treatment, you can recover that amount. For, for decades, it didn't matter what the paid amount was. What mattered for the purpose of economic damages was the billed amount. So what, what was the charge? And there is now a huge conflict of interest where if I have a client get a surgery on Medi-Cal for $3,000, but a doctor may have done that on a lien for $40,000, it greatly affects the value of the case. Oh. 
On the other hand, I want my client to make that decision. I, I don't want to send them toward a doctor and steer them that way because they're also going to be responsible for that cost if the case doesn't work out, you know, the way we hope it does. Yeah. A lot of clients are not being told about this though. Wow. Hmm. Interesting. So where's the line uh, uh, between where, uh, where an attorney should delegate things to, uh, to associate attorneys or, or uh, to paralegals um, and, and what, what sorts of things should the attorney, the attorney who's been retained by the client, the attorney the, that the client has a personal relationship uh, should, uh, should do and should not delegate. Um, you have a, you have a, a firmly drawn line in your mind on, on that question of what to delegate and what to handle personally. It's a really tricky issue, M meaning, you know, it's tough. Um, I, I believe anything substantial, substantive in the case in terms of decisions being made or expectations i i think that should really go up to an attorney to be at least be involved with um but there are a lot of sort of clerical tasks in a case you know uh getting medical records uh updating the file regarding how a client's recovery is coming if it's coming um even basic discovery responses but, but yes, the attorney should be involved anytime there's going to be a, a, a decision that potentially affects the client's expectations or the outcome. Huh. Well, it's have... go ahead. Go ahead Tim. Go well, ahead. at some point, obviously, you uh, you started to do more and more uh, uh, injury law in nursing homes. Tell us how you how you got into that. And obviously that uh, that turned into bed sore law. So t uh, tell us about that transition into your work into uh, nursing home injuries, um, and and uh, finally into bed sore law, which you're which you're doing now as a national practice. Thank you. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. Uh, back in around 2010, I was working for an ex uh, firm that exclusively handled elder abuse and nursing home injuries. Um, we were doing both defense and plaintiffs, and at the time. I went into probably 100 to 200 facilities across the nation yeah. as a defense attorney. Um, it was a very uh, educational experience for me. I learned a lot about that industry. Um, my career then moved toward general injury and trial practice. But when I uh, started my solo practice in 2018, uh, I focused primarily on general injury for the primary reason that uh, skilled nursing cases are very expensive to maintain. Uh, we have a lot of expert witness testimony. We have a tremendous amount of document collection. They're very law and motion heavy. Now um, I'm at a point where I I have the ability to move back towards a nursing home, which I, I actually prefer for a variety of reasons. And I think there's a real need in the current industry uh, legally and the nursing home industry for, for this service for people. Was this an area of law that you sought out or did you suddenly just start getting calls uh, about injuries occurring in nursing homes and it was and then you realized that there was a need here for more uh, for more attention? No, I've kept a hand in it um, even since uh, I left uh, my initial nursing home injury firm about 10 years ago. Um, I've I've litigated these cases all along, but with a focus in general injury, um, our pivot into this industry completely is is a conscious choice to go and seek out more of these cases and help these folks. Is there just uh, not enough attorneys working in this space? That That's an interesting question. Uh, I think there is a bit of an old guard that is coming toward the end of their career. You know, don't tell them I said that, but just age-wise, they're, they're um, getting older. I'm not sure what they're going to do with their practices. There are a lot of younger attorneys getting into the space is a very technical space though. It's very challenging. Um, and the nursing home industry due in part to their own poor decisions, as well as the decisions outside of their control, it, it's getting much worse than it's been even in the last 10 to 20 years. What are some of the uh, uh, the common issues that come up again and again in, uh, in, in these nursing home injury cases? Well, one of the problems uh, we've seen, and, and, and by the way, there are several academics who study this industry um, in considerable detail. Uh, there's long been known to anybody in the industry that there is a correlation between nonprofit ownership and uh, quality of care. So it, it's well known that 
nonprofits provide better care than the for-profit companies. This is documented. Unfortunately, the industry has largely moved to for-profit ownership. What we also see is a correlation between uh, the amount of staffing being provided and the frequency of injuries and bad outcomes. And, and as you can imagine, more staffing and better staffing uh, leads to better outcomes, fewer injuries. But what we've seen over the last 10 years is a real crush down on the staffing. I think it actually improved uh, about 15 years ago, but it's gotten um, increasingly poor over the last 10 years from what I'm seeing in my cases. But now with inflation, uh, the competition for employees, they're really, the nursing home industry is really struggling. Hmm. Are uh, you ever you able to sneak into trial in front of a jury? Uh, some of those stats about the difference between nonprofit and profits and staffing levels? I fortunately don't have to because we have expert witnesses that can do this for us. Yeah. And one of the most uh, well-known and regarded uh, experts is out of uh, University of San Francisco, Charlene Harrington. She's done a lot of work on this industry right. over the last 30 years. Interesting. Hey, one of the lawyers that I follow, he's a personal injury lawyer uh, back east. His name is John Fisher. And uh, he's written a couple of books on about law practice management, but he's also a PI lawyer in addition to an author. And one of his uh, philosophies is he does not agree to confidentiality agreements ever in his medical malpractice cases. I wonder if there are any core values or philosophies like that that are behind, uh, like does Bedsore Law have a broader mission other than just representing folks? It's That's an interesting point. Um, I guess this is a little bit different. I think our broader mission is to become a force to be contended with in this industry. There are some incredibly large injury offices in Los Angeles that are very effective in compelling insurance companies to take their case seriously. The insurance industry, and I have heard you know various anecdotes about why, the insurance industry, from what I understand, over the last 20 to 30 years has become increasingly aggressive in its defense tactics. Um, for example, a year ago, I had a uh, liability denied on a uh, rear end case where my client was like an 80 year old woman. She yeah. adopted a red light and the insurance company denied liability on that case uh, when their insured had rear ended my client. So it is very aggressive out there. We are trying to build a firm with resources and a size that can compete in this field. And I don't believe anybody has done that yet in the nursing home injury uh, space. Are you telling me that an insurance company will give different settlement values to a case based on the identity and perceived uh, aggressiveness of the law firm representing uh, the plaintiff? What we're told, and I haven't been on the other side to see this, is that they do track results of individual attorneys of law firms oh. and meticulously analyze the data of jury verdicts in a given uh, jurisdiction. They're very savvy. And to be fair, it's not illegal. It's not unlawful. Some of my colleagues, uh, I think, get very emotional about it. But um, unfortunately, this is business for the insurance industry. And, and you know, they're allowed to do this. So what would happen if the insurance company saw that the uh, the plaintiff's attorney was uh, you know ha had retained uh, a, a certified appellate specialist and they were ready to go the distance in this case? Uh, that means that they're going to uh, they're going to they're going to take this case more seriously, increase their offers. You know, maybe um, one of you guys would like to jump in pro bono on some of my cases, and and we can <laughs> test that theory. Uh, the insurance industry, my experience. That what they really are afraid of are economic damages. Um, that's their main. So I'm not sure if the appellate angle uh, is right. going to make too many waves with them. Yeah, yeah, they're 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 looking out to see if uh, if 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 they're going to get big big dollar verdicts awarded against them. Yes. Uh, hey, I want to back up uh, to earlier in our interview. We were talking about the cap on non-economic injuries in California. Is there a movement to change that or is that going to change anytime soon? I think we talked before uh, uh, this interview about uh, tying it to inflation or tell me about where the law is headed in terms of that cap. Sure. Uh, so that's already happened. Um, there was a very quick development earlier this year 
and, and this is this as you can imagine this cap is something that has been fought since essentially it was uh legislated in 1975 but earlier this year through the work of some very fantastic attorneys and uh people on both sides of the table uh they reached an agreement and the law is changing for the first time in almost 50 years. Uh, the cap will go up from $250,000 to $350,000 next year. It will continue to increase for uh, 10 years. And then there is a, an adjustment uh, yearly for inflation. Oh, that's great. That's fantastic. Now in your um, practice in uh, against nursing homes, uh, does, the, does the micro law apply there as well? It, it does. And, and for a couple of reasons, one, um, the burden to prove elder abuse is much more stringent than the burden to prove medical negligence. So we have some overlap. But what's really interesting to me at the moment, and, and elder abuse is such an interesting field from, I think, an, an appellate standpoint, uh, in elder abuse, they, for whatever reason, they tied a pre-death pain and suffering cap. They tried a pre-death pain and suffering cap uh, to the micro cap, uh, I think back in the nineties when elder abuse was legislated a and the reason they did this was to incentivize suits. But what's interesting is a year ago, well, or in fact, a year ago, they legislated a new pre-death pain and suffering law in general, and it took effect earlier this year that now allows pre-death pain and suffering for the first time in the history of California to be recovered by anyone. And so what's interesting about the elder abuse is now what was an incentive has essentially become a penalty. And I'm not aware that anybody has, a uh, you know, amended that or fought to change that yet. Huh. Mm. So, so uh, explain that again. So there was a, there's a pre-death pain and suffering payment. There used to be a cap on it. But right. So until January 1st, 2022, nobody could recover pre-death pain and suffering damages. You could have a wrongful death lawsuit, but if somebody died before, their recovery so what the, it, what it the died with the plaintiff right so what yeah. the legislator did a few decades ago uh because as you can imagine if somebody is abused at 85 they may not live to see justice in their lifetime uh the legislator said okay we'll allow up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars of pre-death pain and suffering for these folks okay. okay and that can be recovered by the estate uh the the, the representative uh, which is often the successor in interest but now, um, generally, we treat elder abuse cases as un uncapped. They're not subject to the micro cap. Mm -hmm. But because of this, the wording of this legislation, uh, it's anybody's guess what a judge would do if, so it's if somebody re recovers. So it's, you know, it's now unclear what, whether this pre-death pain and suffering, might, it's, it may be limited by micro or it may be uh, unlimited under the, uh, the elder abuse statutes. Well, I think because of the the shift uh, to allow pre-death pain and suffering for everyone, that the cap should be, you know, it's it's become moot for elder abuse, but it's still in the books. And yeah. presumably the people involved with the micro change were aware of it. So I could see a judge saying, well, you know, they could have changed that at the same time. That's yeah. So this is, is an, this is an open question that that uh, that we need to watch. Fertile ground for some appellate lawyer to come in and exploit. <laughs> that's right uh let me ask you this maybe this is a better question for tim but uh kyle what would you say uh your opponents uh would say is unique about you or the way you handle your cases my opponents um I, i'm pretty transparent in, in and we could ask tim by the way who was recently my opponent <laughs> i i try to be pretty transparent i i truly believe in civility um I like to work with the other side to reach a fair outcome, whatever, you know, whatever we decide that is. On the other hand, you know, if we go to war, we go to war and it will be merciless and we'll get what our clients deserve. <laughs> yeah. L luckily, I didn't see the merciless side of Kyle. We were, uh, uh, I came in late in the case and we were able to, I was, I was only able to see this side. Uh, of Kyle, we were able to just get the get the thing resolved. So, uh, yeah, very very transparent and and, and civil. Um, it's usually what uh, usually our experience, Jeff, as appellate attorneys, we kind of swoop in and we have plausible deniability that hey, I don't know what 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 happened before. <laughs> uh, let's let's all be friends now. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, I love practicing appellate law. The appellate bar is so much more polite, and um, it's it's a great practice. Yeah. Oh. Well, 
tell anybody that it's a great time. <laughs> but Kyle, speaking of merciless advocacy, uh, uh, do, do you have any good war stories you can share with our audience? War stories, you know, particularly where you've been merciless. <laughs> <laughs> I so may, maybe this will fall into that category. I tried a case, a relatively small case. You know, no, none of the damages are small for my clients, but this was uh, value wise a smaller case. Uh, less than a month after I came back from the trial lawyers college, and it was in the Long Beach courthouse. It was a soft tissue uh, rear end crash, very minimal damage. These are very tough cases because juries typically don't like them. And we got into a discussion during voir dire uh, where half the panel, uh, not the panel, half the folks in the box brought up examples of plaintiffs lying about injuries. Um, one, one woman mentioned a guy who walked with a cane during his trial while she was on a jury and then saw him at like a 7-Eleven uh, right after the, the day was over. And, you know, he had no cane and was walking fine. Another woman said she handled workers' comp cases for an employer and they had videos of people, you know, faking all their injuries. And as you can imagine, as a trial lawyer, I'm <laughs> thinking, oh boy, um, this is not going to go well. Uh, in fact, the um, foreman ended up being a an executive assistant to the, at the time, the city attorney ballet, who said that all they dealt with all day long were unjust employment lawsuits in her office. So this uh, case was a dispute over, we had demanded $27,000 for a client who had several injections into his back in order to get uh, better. Um, he was a young guy, uh, taught for a, a special ed, very nice guy. And the defense only, Mercury Insurance only wanted to pay $12,000 on the case. Um, and I think we were being pretty reasonable. So what happened is, through reviewing the whole file and going through the case, this was a case I took on from another firm, uh, the defense had claimed that they were going, you know, X amount at the time of the crash, I think 30 miles per hour. And in trial, the defendant testified he'd been going about 10 miles per hour at the crash. And I had asked this jury in voir dire, can you allow for the possibility that not only some people out in the world will lie to get money, that there are people in the world who will lie to win the case as a defendant. And so what? when on the stand, this guy, and, and by the way, he, you know, he owned a business downtown. He drove like a supercharged X5. He had like a Rolex on and um, kind of this impatient old man, um, the old being in his seventies. Uh, he clearly didn't want to be there. Um, when he repeatedly said they were, couldn't have been going more than 10. And then we brought out his interrogatory responses saying he was going about 30. I think that was the end of the case. Yeah. There. And yeah. Mercury ended up paying about 75,000 on that case. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask you this before about uh, when you, uh, when you mentioned, uh, when you mentioned about how insurance companies are very savvy. And so they will, they will study the plaintiff's attorneys uh, to see if they, you know, uh, how, how, uh, what's their exposure uh, as against this particular attorney, what are their resources like? Um, do you think that they have uh, uh, they they have research on this, and is it discoverable? No, it's definitely not going to be discoverable. Um, I'm not sure if you've had any cases come up involving attorney work product, but but a few years ago, it became much more, uh, I think, restrictive the the law surrounding attorney work product. Um, you know, I think there's a mythology on my side of the, the the courtroom where there are some conspiracy theories about the insurance companies and whatnot, but I have repeatedly heard um, that they do track this information. You know, is this data that's shared among insurance companies or is it just, you know, each insurance company keeps track of its own? I have no idea. Huh. Okay. Uh, and uh, another question about uh, about the micro law and and the fact that bed sore law is a national practice, and so you've got cases not just in California but in other states. Um, how do you compare litigating these cases against nursing homes uh, in other states as compared to California? Is it uh, do, do California laws make it make it more difficult uh, than practicing in other states? How do you rate it? 
It really depends. Um, some states are more restricted than California. Others are less. Uh, there are states that have certain immunities that we don't. Y you know, I think it really comes down to the jurisdiction of the jurors. Uh, that That's really, at the end of the day, um, unless you get pulled into arbitration, these cases are going to be decided by a jury. And, and so both sides are trying to figure out, is that a jury that's going to be uh, sympathetic to this argument and this injury. And, and if, if, you know, if they're, if you're, if you're stuck in Orange County, um, you're expecting a worse outcome than if you get into LA County, because the jurors down there are on the whole. And, th and by the way, this is not a black and white rule. You can have a worse outcome in LA than Orange County, but it, on the whole, the statistics are that Orange County is going to give you a lower result. So there are states that are the same way. Yeah, and how do you how do you account for that? And uh, I've I've heard the same thing from med mal attorneys that uh, that some will just leave the practice entirely because they're just it just makes them sick to get uh, to get all the way up to trial, prepare, put on a great trial for a worthy, uh, deserving plaintiff, and yet you have uh, jurors who just decide, well, but this is a doctor. Doctors can do no wrong. And uh, how do you account for that bias? And and does it really vary, uh, uh, vary so much by juris from one jurisdiction to another? It, it does. Um, in my experience, it does. There there are so many factors in these cases. I mean, listen, I've I've heard that there have been verdicts decided because they didn't like the shoes, you know, that the female counsel was wearing or something like that. Jur jurors can be very they're they're human beings, right? They can be very. Um, just very arbitrary and capricious at times, which is why authenticity is so important in that process. When, when I had this case that I talked about in Long Beach with what I would uh, characterize as relatively conservative jurors, I spent a lot of time talking to them, asking um, if they could be receptive to certain evidence. So what we look at when we're handling a case in a conservative jurisdiction, we look at who who's involved. And to your point, um, you know, I would much rather have a nursing home defendant than a doctor defendant. A doctor defendant is almost always going to be uh, liked by a jury. Yeah. Nursing home is often not liked by a jury. What are but, some questions you like to ask during voir dire to try to uh, try to get the sense of the jury? And if they are a conservative jury who's going to put the thumb on the scale in favor of the doctor or, or a jury who is going to be a little bit more independent minded? So based on my training... Uh, I try, you know, and listen, I'm a human being. I have my own prejudices that quite frankly, I wish I didn't have, but, um, and I think I'm not too much of a prejudiced person, but who knows? That's probably what prejudiced people say, right? <laughs> uh, I, I try not to approach, uh, jurors with any preconceptions because one, I, I've never, you know, the people who, my most recent case, a couple of years ago, a trial, uh, before the pandemic blew everything up, uh, the people who I thought were going to be with me weren't and somebody who I thought didn't like my case was the most favorable. So I really try to be authentic with them. Um, I, and it's the hardest thing to do. And this is what we spend some of the most time on in the trial lawyers college. Uh, we want to hear people out. We don't want to judge them. We don't want to argue as an attorney, you know, stereotypically, if somebody disagrees with us, we want to argue with them and win them over, right? Yeah. But but that's the worst thing you can do. So what what I do and what my uh, colleagues do, we ask them, tell me more. Why why do you feel that there are too many lawsuits? Why do you feel that a million dollars for a serious injury hmm. is inappropriate? Let let me hear that out, and you know I'll probably agree with it, even though even if I don't agree with the ultimate uh, principle. I, I can agree. Yeah, I, I think there are too many lawsuits. I think it's terrible. But look, you know, this is how we solve problems. So can we at least agree that we want to do the right thing here? Yeah. Huh. Hey, you mentioned COVID-19 blowing up. Uh, how did COVID-19 impact you and your practice? And and do you think you're back to normal now in terms of uh, the way we're litigating cases? You know, I, I don't think anyone's back to normal. Um in short, I, I still vividly remember March and April 2020. It was, it was terrible for me. I, uh, you know, I have two small kids. Um, my wife and my parents are elderly. 
uh, I had just expanded my business, which was about two years old. You know, we, we moved into bigger office space. <laughs> right. I hired people uh, like in February of 2020. <laughs> And um, we were very vulnerable as, as a business entity. So it was terrifying. Um, everything slowed down for us. You know, everything came off the rails for several months. What, what I don't think, ha it, it, what, so let me start with a good thing. Uh, a great thing is moving to remote. Um, I can't tell you how many hearings I've had uh, that ended up being a five minute hearing. I had a hearing two weeks ago where uh, the defense had two clients, didn't pay first fees for one of them. So the judge continued out uh, this hearing for 60 days. That would have been a four hour time commitment for yeah. me before the pandemic. Now it was like a two minute, you know, I'm working, they call the matter and we do it. So it, and the, the difference there is I, I'm not hourly, so I don't bill for travel. I think a lot of defense attorneys who did bill for travel, this is affected. Um, I get to work more on my clients cases rather than sitting on the 405 and traffic. Uh, but what I think has really been detrimental to uh, the legal climate is the effect on the employment market. It is very expensive to find people and is very hard, harder. It's always been hard to find people, but I think it's more expensive and harder than ever, which is a challenge because there are so many man hours to go into these cases. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right. Jeff, uh, do you want to, do you want to uh, uh, talk about this? Uh, uh, some of our news and tidbits with Kyle. Sure, yeah, we wanted to do a, a follow up on the Trujillo case. Yeah, you know, uh, and, and Kyle, we thought thought maybe you'd had some insights on this because it deals with a nine nine eight offer, which uh, which uh, I assume comes up uh, quite frequently in your practice. We we talked about this case Trujillo versus City of Los Angeles uh, in episode fifty eight. It's a October two thousand twenty two case. It's uh, it was a, a published decision. Uh, out of the Second District Court of Appeal. So it was a case about accepting a Code of Civil Procedure Section 998 offer of compromise. The court in Trujillo held that the acceptance was not valid because even though it was within the statutory 30 days, uh, normally the 998 offer, if it's accepted within 30 days, uh, that's it. Settlement has to, A judgment has to be entered on the settlement. But that didn't happen in Trujillo because the acceptance had come after the trial court had already orally granted a summary judgment. So the 998 offer came some a few days before the hearing on uh, on the defendant's summary judgment motion. At the hearing, the court orally granted the motion, but before the judgment actually came down, the the uh, the plaintiff, who had great presence of mind, uh, immediately sent over a signed. Uh, accepted version of the 998 and then sent that up to the to the trial court to get that entered as a judgment. But the court of appeal said no dice. Um, but you know, so we talked about that, as I said, uh, Jeff and I did. Uh, but, uh, you know, Trujillo, that, that opinion has been bothering me ever since. And I wrote up a summary of the case and and uh, outlined all the things that seemed uh, to me not right about the decision. And one of the things that bothered me is that the court drew a bright line at oral rulings on MSJs. Uh, reasoning that the bright line was necessary to prevent mischief, because you, you can see why the outcome made some common sense that, look, the, the writing was already on the wall. You can't, can't that's not what the 998 uh, uh, procedure is for. Um, but So I get, I get uh, preventing mischief in that case, but on that score, what about tentative rulings? What if instead of uh, showing up at the hearing and getting an oral ruling granting the summary judgment, there had just been a tentative ruling uh, the day before the hearing? Uh, Trujillo doesn't prevent uh, the plaintiff from immediately sending back the signed accepted version of the 998 offer then. Um, uh, and I thought the court could have done that. Court, court could do what it does with dismissals. Uh, there are cases where after a judge has has uh, made unfavorable statements at an MSJ hearing, a plaintiff dismisses the case without prejudice in order to avoid an award of attorney's fees under uh, Civil Code 1717. But courts have consistently held that once the writing is on the wall, you cannot avoid a prevailing party determination that way. And, and then someone... Uh, uh, on LinkedIn pointed out to me, this is a follower of the podcast, Igor Lukashin, uh, pointed out that, that under federal rule of civil procedure 68, uh, which has the same basic structure as 998, 
Uh, as long as the offer is served 14 days before trial, the 14-day period under Rule 68, as long as it's served within the, the statutory period and accepted within that period, judgment must be entered on the settlement. And there's no escape hatch for oral or tentative MSJ rulings. Uh, and there's a recent case on that, Kubiak versus County of Ravali. Uh, it's a Ninth Circuit opinion back in May of this year, 2022, where the defendant had made a Rule 68 offer and a few days later, the court granted summary judgment. But just as in Trujillo, before the court got around to entering judgment, the plaintiff rushed ahead, uh, uh, accepted the offer, submitted it to the clerk who, as, as part of the clerk's ministerial duties, entered judgment on the Rule 68 settlement. And the Ninth Circuit held that's, that's it. Rule 68, quote, was designed to function in a mechanical manner. A Rule 68 offer once made is non-negotiable. It is either accepted, in which case it's automatically entered by the court or rejected. Uh, wow. so <laughs> and think about this, Tim. When you make a 998 offer, uh, if you've already filed your MSJ, 75 days uh, notice for an MSJ, uh, a 998 offer is held open by law for 30 days. If you're making that 998 offer, the MSJ has already been filed, might have even already seen the opposition papers. Uh -huh. uh, you're calculating in your 998 offer a chance you might win the MSJ, you might not. And so, yeah, this result really bothered me. And also, after MSJ, let's say you're thinking about hiring an appellate specialist to do an appeal, um, and you want to do a 998 offer in terms of hedging your bets, in terms of whether the appeal would uh, um, be successful or not. This yeah. case seems to foreclose post-judgment uh, by MSJ, post-judgment 998 offers to hedge your bets on appeals. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And uh, I, it's, I I tend to a, to a more formalist approach. And so I just follow what, whatever the text of the statute says. And and I know the court is trying to avoid an, a, what seems to be an absurdity here or or at least some mischief. Um, and again, I, 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 I get that. But uh, I tend to agree with the uh, with the Ninth Circuit's approach here that the that the rules should just be mechanical. And if the legislature wants to uh, to provide for exceptions uh, or discretionary you know, some dis you know vest some discretion in the trial court to uh, uh, to avoid unseemly results then it could do that but it it didn't do that in 998 and it didn't do it in in uh, rule 50, uh, rule 68 uh, and yet you have you know two two jurisdictions the California Court of Appeal interpreting 998 in a very different way than the Ninth Circuit and other circuits have interpreted FRCP 68. Uh, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> All uh, right. The other tidbit I want to just announce, we'll just have a link in our, in our case notes to this. We talked in an earlier episode about a fantastic amicus brief that was filed by the, uh, by the, the onion in a, in a case, uh, seeking review in the, uh, United States Supreme court about parody, how much parody is protected or not. And recently, uh, the Babylon B website, which is a fake news website. Uh, filed a, an amazing amicus brief. It's an interesting read, and we'll put a link to that in our show notes. Yeah. <laughs> you, you call the Babylon Bee a fake news website? <laughs> That's what I call it. What would you, How would you describe it? It's a, it's a parody news website. Or what okay. about the uh, the Onion? Is Onion also a fake news website? Yes. It's fake news. It's it, not real. It's scary that we're <laughs> differentiating in our society between those terms at this point. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, it is. It is. Yeah, fake news is a has a de definite negative connotation. You're you're up to no good. Uh, okay. All right. It, they are both parody websites. <laughs> How about that? All right. So uh, that see, I, I've come news. to the rescue. I've come to the rescue of both the Onion and the Babylon Bee. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, I think that uh, wraps up this episode. Thanks so much, Kyle, for uh, coming in and sharing your wisdom and defending. Uh, the existence of personal injury lawyers in our society. Um, yeah, and, and and sharing for us about bed sore law, a national practice that uh, that defends uh, d defends inhabitants and their families in nursing homes against uh, against negligence and other predations and liability that occurs in nursing homes across the country. So I think that I, I think you're filling a f uh, you're filling a need there, Kyle. So I, I applaud that effort. You know, we, right. we love we love what we do, and I just want to thank you guys for having me on today. 
Yeah, of course. Happy to do it. Uh, we want to th- also thank uh, Case Text for sponsoring the podcast. Each week we include links to the cases we discuss using Case Text. And listeners of the podcast can receive a 25% lifetime discount available if they sign up at casetext.com slash C-A-L-P. And if you have suggestions for future episodes, please email us at info at calpodcast.com. And in our upcoming episodes, look for more guests and perspectives uh, on how to uh, improve your practice. See you next time. You have just listened to the California Appellant Podcast a discussion of timely trial tips and the latest cases and news coming from the California Court of Appeal and the California Supreme Court. For more information about the cases discussed in today's episode, our hosts, and other episodes, visit the California Appellate Law Podcast website at calpodcast.com. That's calpodcast.com. Thanks to Jonathan Caro for our intro music. Thank you for listening, and please join us again.